Let's go ahead and start the recording. All right, it is uh, Friday. We are live. Let's get started. Welcome back to Structural Analysis. Hope everybody's uh, uh, doing well on this Friday. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, so our attendance grades are up to date. Um, as for homework, uh, your homework 2.4 was graded, uh, graded uh, was finished this morning. Uh, so the grades are now um, uh, posted as well as the solution. So you should see all of that now. Um, your first trust assignment uh, was due today right before class. Uh, and then your second assignment uh, will be assigned today and it'll be due Monday. Um, and overall, I, I think you're going to find after today's lecture, and when you look at the homework, it's, it, it's not as long of an assignment as it seems. It's actually pretty short uh, because today what we're going to do is we're going to look at something that we kind of skipped on Wednesday, kind of skipped it on purpose because I wanted everybody to have a little bit of experience with trusses before we talked about uh, stability and determinacy. Uh, and then we're going to look at some more practice on the method of joints because I've got two examples uh, that I want to do. Uh, if you look here on the, uh, on the screen, you'll see that I've got a truss drawn up here. And if you look later on in the slides, you'll see that the truss is, it, it looks kind of like a nightmare compared to the one that we did uh, on Wednesday. But um, what you'll find is that this truss is symmetric, not only with respect to the loading, but with respect to the geometry. In other words, if you were to pr print this on a sheet of paper and you were to fold it like that, you'd get the same truss on either side. And so what we can do is when we analyze this truss, we actually only have to analyze half of it. We start at the left side, work our way over, and once we solve all of these lines that are dashed, we're good. Because, for instance, if you're looking at member CJ, whatever force that you get in CJ, you get the same force in, in the corresponding member over here. I think it's EJ. Uh, and this IJ is going to be the same as JK and, and so on and so forth. And the reason why is because both the loading and the geometry are uh, symmetric. Um, and so that, uh, that happens a lot uh, in structural engineering. And so when you have a uh, something that you can exploit like symmetry, we do because it makes our lives easier. Okay, uh, let's get back to the slides and uh, let's go into our discussion. Um, first off, uh, let me skip ahead a bit. Okay, so let's just make sure we're all uh, on, uh, you know, on the same page, back to square one. So uh, let's recall from you know some of the assumptions that we made when we analyzed trusses, you know, we assumed that all the members were connected by frictionless uh, joints. We uh, assumed that all of the loads and the support reactions are applied only at the joints. Uh, and then at each of the joints, all of the centroidal axes of each of the members coincide. And so what that does is it results in members that only experience axial load. There's no shear, no bending. So when you cut a section through a member, it's only experiencing either tension or compression. That's it. Okay, now what that means uh, for us is that, uh, you know, we only have axial loads, and now we have to go through and determine those internal forces. And we really have two methods at our disposal. We have the method of joints. We have the method of sections. We'll do some method of sections problems next week, probably on Wednesday. Um, but uh, today I want to talk a little bit more about the method of joints, and I want everybody to remember that when we did the method of joints, we were limited to joints with two unknowns, okay, because we only had two equations of equilibrium that we can apply. Some of forces in the x direction and some of forces in the y direction. Because all of the forces all meet at one common point, there is no moment. You know, there's a moment is a force offset by a given distance from the point that you're considering. Well, none of the forces are offset. They're all meeting at the same point. So because of that, we only have two, we can only deal with two unknowns at a time. And I want you to keep that number two in your head uh, because that's going to show up here in a second. Um, what I want to do is I want to take a real quick detour and talk about internal indeterminacy, um, unknowns versus knowns, when you're doing trust analysis. And I want to talk about a new term, uh, this term I sub T. It's really simple to compute, but uh, I'll introduce it. I want everybody to understand uh, where it's coming from. Now, to explain IT, I want to go back to something that we talked about a little while ago. I want to talk about IE. Okay. So let's recall this uh, term IE. IE was the degree of external indeterminacy. So the idea is you have a structure, and basically what this formula is is just a mathematical way of comparing your knowns in the structure with your unknowns. Okay, so what are your knowns? Well, when you're looking at a structure externally, um, you're just looking at the support reactions and ensuring that the structure can maintain uh, equilibrium. So what are your uh, knowns externally? Well, 
you have three knowns right off the bat because you know that for the entire structure, sum of forces in the x direction has to be zero, sum of forces in the y direction, and sum of moments has to be zero externally. Uh, and then externally, you also know uh, your equations of condition. So if you have this structure and there's a hinge right there, you know that the sum of the internal moments is zero at that hinge. And so that's that term, equations of condition. So what are your, that's your knowns, what are your unknowns? Well, if you're looking at it externally, your unknowns are your reactions, okay? So we compare the unknowns versus the knowns, and we compute this term, i.e., the degree of external indeterminacy. So, uh, you know, R is our unknown support reactions, E sub C is our equations of condition, and so we get the following mathematical relationship. If I is zero, then the structure should be statically uh, determinate. If it's less than zero, it should be unstable, uh, or the structure is unstable if it's less than zero. If it's greater than zero, it should be statically indeterminate. And remember that term should be, there are a couple of rules for that. The reactions can't all be concurrent and they can't all be uh, parallel, okay? And so that's that's what we had, had discussed externally, okay? Now what I wanna do is I wanna talk about internal indeterminacy. And the easiest way to describe that is to look at this example, okay? Now, this example um, is, is uh, you know, we have a, a fairly straightforward truss, um, but I want to think about this truss for a second, okay? So first off, and I'm going to use my pen here for a second, so forgive me if the uh, the artwork is a, is a bit off, but I'll do my best. Okay, so first off, let's look at it externally. So externally, I have one, two, three equations of, uh, or three reactions. So think about this from an IE perspective. So R equals three. There's no equations of condition because I don't, it's not, I mean, it's not like a beam where I have internal hinges. So I'd take E sub C to be zero. So my IE value, oh, using my mouse, this is tough. Yeah. IE is zero, okay? So this structure is statically determinate externally. In other words, I can compute the support reactions all day long, okay? Now let's think about this from a method of joints perspective, okay? Let's talk about this from a method of joints. Well, um, let's see. Um, remember the rule. I only have two equations of equilibrium, so I can only solve a joint that has two unknowns, okay? So can I solve this joint right here? Uh, no, I've got three members. What about this one? No, I've got three members. What about this one? Well, this one has like five members. Um, this one, this one. We're starting to run into a little bit of a problem here. See, it doesn't matter where you start. There are too many unknowns. Uh, then we have equations of equilibrium when we start applying our method of joints. So we have a little bit of a different classification that we have to, to make. This particular structure that you see here, I mean, this is a structure that externally is determinate, but internally it's indeterminate. There are too many unknowns inside the truss to be able to solve for the members. I can get the reactions all day long, but I can't, uh, there's too many unknowns, okay? Let's look at this table here on the bottom right. Let's compute, or let's look at this as if it was a method of joints problem, and let's ask ourselves what are our unknowns and what are our knowns? Let's start off with the knowns. Well. How many joints does this structure have? Well, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it has ten joints. Well, I propose that for each one of those joints, I can write two equations of equilibrium: a sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction. So if I'm looking at this from an internal perspective, there are, I guess, twenty known quantities: sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction for every joint in that structure. Okay. Now, what about my unknowns? Well, what are the unknowns for the structure? Well, there's the reactions. The reactions are unknown because they are applied at the joints, okay? So, so they are unknown. And then there's the internal members. There's gonna be one unknown for every member, okay? So you start counting, I got one, two, three, four on the top, one, two, three, four on the bottom, that's eight. The verticals, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, and then what do I have, 13 and eight is 21, you know, 21 members, and then I've got three reactions, so I've got 24 unknowns, but I only have 20 equations of equilibrium. There's too many unknowns inside the structure to solve for the internal forces of the members. So this structure is internally indeterminate. 
The way that we compute that is we use the following equation. We now have a new term, a degree of internal indeterminacy, and we call this I sub T. And we call it I sub T because it's the internal indeterminacy for trusses. So later on, we have, for instance, an I sub F, an internal indeterminacy for frames, or an internal indeterminacy for beams, you know, uh, and what have you. Uh, but we'll look we'll to that uh, later. Um, but what we do for, 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 from a mathematical perspective is we say that our I sub T is the quantity M plus R minus 2J. And it's the same format. We take our unknowns minus our knowns. So M plus R minus 2J. M plus R is the number of members and the total number of unknown support reactions. And then J is the total number of joints. And it's 2J because for each joint we can write two equations of equilibrium. Now, we also follow the same pattern as we did before. If I sub T is less than zero, the trust should be internally, or the trust is, sorry, is internally unstable. So if I sub T is negative, it, it's unstable. If I sub T is zero, then the trust should be uh, internally determinate. And if it's greater than zero, it should be indeterminate. Now, what do I mean by should be? Well, with reactions, we said that, yeah, just because you have a non-negative I value, it doesn't mean it's stable. You know, what, what does stable mean? Well, stable externally meant the reactions can't be concurrent and they can't be, uh, uh, they can't be uh, 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 parallel. What does should be mean for internal indeterminacy? Admittedly, that one's a little bit trickier to determine when you just look at the truss, but the rule basically means is that, um, the truss is going to be internally stable, and, and, and you know, here's the, the, the literal definition. The truss is internally stable if the truss is constrained against rigid body movements. And that's admittedly a bit tough to just see when you just look at a truss, okay? Um, a clear indicator if your truss is unstable internally is when there's a region that doesn't have triangles. Like if you look at trusses, like our example, there's triangles all over the place, okay? If you have a region in your truss that is devoid of triangles, typically that means that the truss is unstable because like if you look at this image here on the bottom right and you take that truss and you just apply a lateral load, it's just gonna, boo, it's just gonna, gonna fall over. Um, another, um, another thing that happens when you have an unstable truss internally is when you start solving it, you get results that, that don't really make sense. Like you'll get, forces that are zero on one side of the joint and not zero on the other. Like it, the, the, the numbers won't make sense. Like when you do, when you have a, a truss that's internally stable, when you do all of your method of joints, everything matches. Well, when it's unstable, that tends to not happen. And to be fair, I'm not going to, I mean, we're not going to be dealing with unstable structures, so it's really not that big of a deal. I just wanted to make sure that you're uh, aware of this. And, and, uh, Will there, uh, will there ever be a support reaction that also produces a moment? Are you talking about like a fixed end? I want to make sure I'm, 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 talking, about, like, I'm, I'm talking about a fixed end because I thought with trusses, they aren't designed like the joints aren't designed to handle moments. So if, if you have a joint in a truss that is connected to the external reaction and that external reaction is handling a moment, then wouldn't that mean that the joint for the truss is also handling a moment? That's a great question. And, and to answer it, we, you don't really, you don't use fixed uh, uh, connection or fixed ended uh, connections for trusses. In fact, later on, so what we're going to do later on is we're going to use some software to analyze trusses and uh, you'll, you'll see what happens. So let's say, let's take this truss. Okay. And let's say that we modeled this as a truss in, 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 in the program's called RESA. So let's say we model this truss in RESA and at point A, we have a, a pin or a hinge pin connection. What if we said, no, 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 no. We're going to make A a fixed connection. Well, the, what, what'll happen is your moment reaction will just be zero. Uh, because you've connected everything as a pin jointed member, it, there just won't be any moment. So, um, so you could put a, a fixed connection there, but because you're dealing with the trust, you just, you won't get a moment reaction. It'll just be zero. That's a great question. So yeah, so whenever we're dealing with trusses, either pin connections or roller connections. And if you have a fixed connection, it, it, it would just be zero. In fact, you go, go flip through your textbook. You won't find a truss that has a fixed connection because it, it, it doesn't mean anything for trusses. 
That's a great question. And I mean, please, if you got questions like that, just, just throw them out there. All right. Um, let, let's get into our method of joints example. Now, this one is a bit hairier. It's a bit nastier. But again, we're only going to solve half of it um, because the truss is symmetric. Now, when, now I want to be crystal clear. Um, the only way that we can exploit symmetry is if the truss is symmetric with respect to the loading and the geometry. Okay, if you look at the truss example that we did in class last time, that truss was symmetric with respect to the geometry, but it wasn't symmetric with respect to the loading because we had loading going this way and loading going that way and, and loading going every which way. I mean, again, imagine if I printed this on a sheet of paper and folded it about the DJ line. I mean, it's going to be the exact truss. Uh, but the moment that I, let's say I delete the load at I, but I leave everything else, then I can't do this. I have to solve the entire truss. But a lot of times in structural engineering, we deal with symmetric structures, so uh, I'm, I want to uh, exploit that. The other two things I want to point out is if you look at the gray region on the top right, you'll see that I went ahead and computed the IT value, and you get an IT value of zero. So this structure is uh, uh, likely determinate externally as well as internally. Um, last, before we jump right into this, uh, if you look at the truss, the members have different slope ratios. It's not all three to four. In fact, they're, they're kind of messy. You got one that's like some that are at one to two, some are at two to ones, and, and or, or uh, some are at two to threes, and or, or one to ones. It, it, it's kind of all over the place. And I also didn't include the slope ratio. So we're going to kind of have to figure that out uh, as we go. Um, but uh, one thing I do want to point out, and I kind of want to write this here on the board. Uh, so I'm going to stop my share because... Um, I want to sort of knock through this truss really quickly, and so I want to um, I, I want to plan my strategy out right now. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to start at the left, and I'm going to work my way over. Okay, and I'm going to hold fast to the rule that I can only solve uh, a G two unknowns. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to solve joint A. Okay. Now, when I solve joint A, what is joint A going to give me? It's going to give me this member and this member. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. After joint A, what joint should I go to next? I'm going to ask the chat or your microphone. You tell uh, me which one am I going to go to next. Joint H, because after we figure out limb AH, we only have BH and HI. There you go. Exactly right. So, okay, now that's that's B, that's uh, B, uh, H, so that's going to give me this member, and that's going to give me this member, okay? Now, what's my next joint from here? Somebody else. <laughs> joint B. There you go. Exactly right, because joint B is going to give me this joint, or this member, sorry, and it's going to give me this member. Now which joint? Uh, I? I, exactly right. Okay, so that's going to give me this member. That's going to give me this member. And notice how in each of these, I'm still not solving uh, joints that have two diagonals. We're going to do two diagonals on Monday. Um, what's next? Uh, C. C, there we go. And once we've got C... We're going to solve joint D, but when we solve joint D, we really are only going to have to consider this vertical member. That's the only thing we're going to have to deal with because we're going to know this member, and by symmetry, this member is going to equal that member. So really, the only thing we're interested in is that. So maybe I'll put one member here. So now we can now that we've planned this out, when we start doing our math, uh, uh, you know, by hand, we can just sort of knock it out really quick. Like, okay, we're going to do joint A, then we're going to do joint H, then we're going to do joint B, then we're going to do joint I, and we just rock and roll pretty quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and start my share, my screen share. Give me one second. And uh, if you notice, there, I've actually I'm logged in twice. I've got my desktop here, uh, so hopefully I can use that to um, uh, look at the chat so I don't have to hop back and forth so much. Oh my, yeah, that is, that is trippy. Okay, all right, so let's, 
let's do this. Okay, so let me put my screen down. Let me plug this up. All right. Okay. So do you point uh, A first? Okay. So joint A, so we write our joint. And again, just like with before, I went ahead and gave you the support reactions. If the support reactions, again, hopefully by now, I think we're, we're pretty good on that. Let me write that a little lower. Here's our members. And so we're going to have vertical and a horizontal here and a horizontal here. Not all wavy. Maybe I could do that a little better. And then we've got our reaction here. This is A Y. A Y. So Y is 15 kits. And let's name these. This is A B. This is A H Y A H. X. Now, before we start chugging this out, I'm curious, does anybody know what slope ratio we can use right here for this member? Because I didn't give it to you. You kind of have to figure it out. Now, notice the way I had the dimension drawn on the bottom where it says 6 at 12 equals 72. Um, uh, 6 at 72. I see that comment from... from uh, Mr. Enoch, you're right, and, and we're going to be able to, uh, to to use that across the board. Yes, you're, yeah, uh, if you're, you're exactly right. Real structural drawings, that's a notation that they use a lot. It's six spaces, 12 foot apiece. Yeah, yeah you, you, you stole the words right out of my mouth. That happened. You'll see that a lot. So I actually purposefully didn't draw that on the vertical, or I did, but I included the the independent increment, so you can see how it works on the vertical and how it works on the horizontal as well. Now, going back to this member AH, anybody know the slope ratio for this? I'll give you a hint. Like, if this is one, yeah, one what two. is the horizontal component going to be? I heard somebody say something. Yeah, it's one to two. One to two, yeah, because, you know, note, if you look at, you know, this triangle, so this is A, this is H, this is B, this is 12 feet, and this is 6 feet. And so you can just sort of simplify that. 6 to 12 is 1 to 2. So you can, you can simplify that. Okay, so you're going to have to figure that out for some of these problems, so that's just something to keep in mind. All right, let's start checking this out. So we sum forces in the Y direction. And we see, okay, I got 15 kips going up, so that means I gotta have 15 kips going down. So AHY is 15 kips going down. Now I can use my slope ratio. And I look at this and I see the one to two. The two is on the horizontal side, so that means the horizontal component needs to be bigger. It also needs to be pointing to the left because uh, the, the members in compression. So AHX is 2 over 1 AHY or 30 kips this way. And then the sum of forces in the X direction here. Let me scroll down a bit so I got a little bit more room to write. Sum of forces in the X direction tells me that member AB, if I got 30 kips going to the left, I got to have 30 kips going to the right. Now, again, if I'm ever going too fast, y'all stop me and say, whoa, where are you getting these numbers? Like, you're, you're not going to hurt my feelings at all. Okay. Everybody good? good? I think somebody's microphone might be on. I heard somebody go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That would be me. Didn't know it was left on. <laughs> Sorry okay. about that. No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> Curse my microphone. All right, so we have, we have eight. All right, 
So we have member AH. So we uh, say member AH is the square root of AH x squared plus AHY squared. And I'm going to get chat to help me with this one. This is, uh, sorry, let me do that. Really mean. 30 kips squared plus 15 kips squared. And uh, what's that come out to be? See, unlike the problems that we did last time where we were using three, four, five triangles, they come out as, you know, as you know, semi-even numbers. This is going to be, you know, decimals. They're going to they're going to trail off. So we'll say like two decimal places. Thirty-three point And then AB. Well, I mean, we don't need to do that when we got that here. Okay. Therefore, member AB is 30 kips. Now, member AB, is that tension or compression? Tension. There you go. And uh, member AH, I think we already said that. That Yeah, we said that one. That one's in compression. All right. And then, like I said, I think it's a good idea to label that on a, a sort of a master image for your solution. So we'll say this is 30 kips. And this is 33.54 kips. Uh, Dr. Michelson? Yes, sir. I'm I'm just I'm a little bit always confused here, but how do we determine it's in tension and when it's in compression? I know it means that the beam's being pressed. Compression means it's being pressed and tension's being pulled. But how do yes. we, how do we determine what's our value? How do we determine it's in? How do we tension? determine that? The 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 secret is to look at this. Okay, so let's take a look at member A B. Okay. Now, here's the joint right here. That's joint A. Okay. Now, let's look at, oh, I, I can write that better. Okay, that's joint A. Now, like, take a look at force AB. Now, force AB, see how it's pointing away from the joint? So, it's pointing away from the joint. So, here's the joint. So, here's the joint. So, force AB is yanking it. So, it's pulling it in tension. It's pulling away from the joint, okay? So that's why we have force AB in tension because it's pulling away from the joint. Whereas AH, both of those forces are pointing toward the joint. They're pushing on it. So you determine whether or not it's tension or compression by looking at the forces and determining which way they're acting towards the joint. Are they pushing toward the joint or pulling away from the joint? Did that, did that answer your question? Because if not, I, I mean, I want to make sure it's clear. I think I understand. So under that assumption for like force AB, this might be jumping a little bit, the gun a little bit, but if we look at joint B for a moment, that would mean that it would be compression there. No, 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 no. no. It, what we're saying is that force, the member AB is experiencing a tensile force, okay? So when you look at joint B, it is a tensile force. So let me let me draw it like this. Okay. So let's look at it like this. So here's joint A, and the member sort of goes like this, right? And then let's say over here is joint B, and the member goes like this, or the joint goes like this. So it's like that. And it's like that, and it's like that, it's like that. And so those are our joints, right? What I'm saying is that at joint A, the force is tension. So at joint B, the force also has to be tension, equal and opposite. They're either both pulling away from the joint or they're both pushing towards the joints. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand it's more clearly yeah. now. And that's fine. That's what we're here for, you know. So don't don't hesitate. And that's for everybody else in the class. You got questions? Let me know.
Is that good? All right. Well, let me scroll up a little bit. So, uh, sorry, I'm going to erase this because I want to make sure I'm making room for, for my later joints. Okay. So, now we got a perfect uh, uh, illustration of this. So we now look at your, if you look at your screen or my camera. So we did joint A. So joint A is done. So you know good here. Now we're on joint H. So we just keep on trucking. So that's joint H. So let's write that out. And you can always swap back and forth between what's on the screen and my camera if you need to see where I'm getting values. Maybe I'll go ahead and do this. Maybe I'll go ahead and put you know, my slope ratio one to two there. And if you notice, if this is one to two, and I think Mr. Enoch made this point, then that means this one is one to two, and that means that this one is one to two. And so we'll probably use that throughout some of our, our later analyses, or our later joint analyses, I should say, be a little more specific. Okay, so there's the joint. We have a six kip load applied directly to the joint. I'll tell you, when you're doing joint analyses, the easiest thing to forget is the fact that there's a load on the joint. Don't forget to go back to the structure and ask yourself, wait, was there a load there? Because yeah, that's kind of important. We have a, uh, let me scroll down a bit. It's hard to write sometimes when it's kind of low on the screen there. All right, so we got a member here, member here, member there, okay? This is one to two, one to two. And again, if there's, if, I, if my handwriting is atrocious, let me know. I can always rewrite stuff. All right. This is AHX. This is AHY. Okay. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get the values from the previous joint analysis I just did. And so I had AHX was 30 kips. So we'll go ahead and write that. And this was 15 kips. Now we got to ask ourselves the direction. And this is where you go back to this. AH was a member that was experiencing compression. So it needs to experience compression here too. So both of those forces point toward the joint. Okay. And think on the previous side, like AH, on the previous side we had AH pointing to the left. Now we have AH pointing to the right. On the previous side we had AHY pointing downward, now it's pointing upward. Again, equal and opposite. As for our unknowns, we have this member here, which we will call BH. And then we have this member, which we split up into a horizontal and vertical. We'll call this HIY and HIX. And then we look at this just from a sum of forces in the X direction, sum of forces in the Y direction. So I look at this joint and I see how many vertical unknowns do I have? Well, I have two. I got the BH and the HIY. Uh, well, how many horizontal unknowns do I have? I only have one horizontal unknown, and that's the X. So I'm actually going to sum forces in the X direction first. And I see, well, wait a minute. I got 30 kips going to the right. Well, guess what? I got to have 30 kips going to the left. So HIX is 30 kips and that's going to the left, All right? Then whenever you get the uh, one component of a diagonal, use the slope ratio to get the other, HIY. Now be very careful when you're, when you're doing your math here, okay? Just look at the slope ratio. The vertical component is smaller. It's one to two, the vertical is smaller. So you can either do 1 over 2 or 2 over 1, we're going to do 1 over 2 because that will result in a smaller number. So it's always an easy way to remember it like that. And so this is HIX, which is 15 kips, and that 15 kips is going down because they both have to be in compression. Now, now we've got the BH. And so to solve for BH, we're going to do sum of forces in the Y direction. Now, let's clear I have no problem whatsoever if you all want to uh, draw yourself out a little table and say, okay, that, there's a lot going on here. I kind of need to write out what's going up and what's going down. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, I can say AHY is 15 kips. I got my six kip load here. I got HIY here. 
you know, because some of these, like, you start doing them and there's like five or six members and there's loads all over the place. So there's nothing, you know, don't hold back from, from writing this stuff down if you need to. Okay. So I look at this, I got 15 going up. I got six and 15 going down. That BH has probably got to go over here because I got BH plus 15 kips equals six plus 15 is 21 kips. So BH is positive six kips or six kips going up. And so that BH has to go up like that. So nothing wrong with that at all. If you got to do it, nothing wrong with that at all. All right. Before we close this out, use Pythagorean theorem. Like I said, after a while, if this stuff gets kind of boring, then you're probably doing something right because that means that you get it. It's weird. It's like I'm a professor and I'm almost intending that some of this stuff get a little boring. All right. So square root of 30 squared plus 15 squared. We actually just did that one because that, that was the same thing we got here. So I know the number is going to be 33.54. So the only thing we got to do is we got to figure out what's going on with these members. So this is six kips. This is 33.54 kips. What's the deal with these? Are they tension, compression? What's the deal? Making sure everybody's paying attention. Somebody that hasn't responded before. I'll break out the, the roster if I got to and get everybody to type in on the chat. What do we got? We got, are they different? Are they tension, compression? What's the deal? Oh my, I think I might have to start calling names. All right, Mr. Randolph, uh, but okay. Oh man, Mr. Riggs saved you. I'll call you, call you on the next one. Yes, you're, you are correct. They are both compression. So let me go to here. Let me say, okay, this is six kips compression. This is 33.54 kips in compression. And so again, if you switch over to the camera, you'll see that, okay, I'm starting to fill this in. And that's the idea is to sort of work your way over until you fill the whole thing out. All right, so we did joint A, we did joint H, what was next? Joint B, okay. Maybe what I'll do here on the top, maybe I'm going to scroll up a bit because you all can access this notebook. I'm going to say, you know, order of solution. Let's write out what we did. We said A, H, B, I, C, D, and that one's only going to have one member. Just to have it on the notebook so that when you all pull these notes out on your own, you can do that. Okay. Join A, join H, join B. All right. So scroll down a bit. Okay. So we just keep on the trucking. All right. So joint B. Here's the joint. No loads applied at B, and so all I got to do is deal with my members. I got a member this way, member this way, member this way, member this way. Actually, those are a little tiny. Let's make those a little bigger. All right. Now, we know this member and that member. This one's in tension. That one's in compression. So this is in tension. So A, B. 30 kips, yanking away from the joint. That vertical's in compression, so we point that towards the joint. And that is uh, BH is six kips. Now, split that up into uh, diagonal and horizontal, so X and Y components, BIY, BIX, BC. Now, 
Here's the kicker. What is the slope ratio of that diagonal member? And I'm somebody who hasn't answered before. I'm going to call him Mr. Randolph. What is the slope ratio of that member? Okay, you stay five to three. I'm not, I'm not sure on that one. Here, look at it this way. So we're going member uh, BI, right? So how far over do you go in the X direction from B to C? You go 12 feet. Well, how far up do you go from C to I? How far is it from, from, from B to I vertically? Try that one. <laughs> busted, busted. All right, watch, watch me here on the screen. Watch me here on, on, uh, on this. All right, so here we've got member BI. We're asking, what's this slope ratio? Well, this dimension here, 12 feet. That dimension here from B to I, 12 feet, one to one. That's a one to one slope ratio. Busted, absolutely busted. That is a one to one. Okay, all right, I'm just messing with you, okay. Sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction. I got two unknowns in the horizontal, one unknown in the vertical. So we'll sum forces in the y direction first. So I got six down, BIY has got to be six kips going up. And then if I use my slope ratio, So my slope ratio tells me that they're one to one. So BIX has got to be BIY. The magnitude has to be the same, so that's six kips. As for the direction, BIY points away from the joint. BIX also got to point away, pull away from the joint. So that way. Now. Sum of forces in the x direction. Now help me out with that. Uh, let's see. I'm calling on somebody. Let's see. All right. Uh, Mr. Mr. Cochran. Let's see. Tell me what. Tell me what uh, BC is. Hope, hopefully you're not vacuuming or, or something. There we go. There we go. 24 kips. Now, what direction, uh, left or right? There you go, right. That is right. It is going to the right. Okay, <laughs> so BI, so now we do our diagonal. BI is the square root of, oh, hold on. we'll do that a little better. BI x squared plus BIY squared, so 6 kip squared plus 6 kip squared. All right. I think you all could probably do that one on your own. So just 6 squared plus 6 squared squared of 72 comes out to something like 8.49 kips. Now, BC, oh, BC. BC was 24 kips. BI is 8.49 kips. Ms. Hudson, what's the deal? Tension, compression, help me out. While you're helping me out, I'll write these up here. Both tension, right, exactly right. So tension, tension, there we go. 
So this is 24 kips. And this is 8.49 kips. Now, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to keep on trucking until we hit 1050. And so we'll, we'll go as fast as we can. But because we're running short on time, uh, I do want to maybe fast forward a bit and show you something that's going to happen at joint D. So we'll, um, let me stop my share because I want to make a point on something. Okay. I just want to point this out because we probably will run out of time and that, you know, that, that's fine. I'd rather take a second and do this. So here's joint D. So remember what's going to happen. Okay. So we, what were we going to go next? We were going to solve joint I, which will give us this member and this member. And then we're going to solve joint C, which will give us this member and this member. Tell you what, before we look at joint D, let's go ahead and answer this question. Can anybody tell me what the ratio of this member is going to be? Or we'll see. Give, give Mr. Randolph a, a chance to, to redeem himself on that one. Are they in the dryer? There we go. You're exactly right. That's a three and that's a two. Okay. So three to two. Yeah, because that's 18 feet and that's 12 feet. Okay. I want to show you real quick what's going to happen at joint D. So let's think of the strategy. Okay. We're going to go into joint D knowing what this force is. So let's say here's my joint. Okay. And I'm going to know this force. So it does, it, for the purpose of the discussion, it's not going to matter whether or not it's left or right. Let's go ahead and say, actually, let's say it's, it's acting to the left. I'm going to have an unknown member this way and an unknown member vertically. Okay. Now, what I can do from a sum of forces in the X direction and a sum of forces in the Y direction perspective is, first off, symmetry and the sum of forces in the X direction tells me that whatever this member is, this member is going to be the same thing in the opposite direction. Okay. But what about this member right here, this vertical? What force is going to be inside this vertical member? Can somebody look at this and tell me what the answer is going to be? It's a zero force member. You're exactly right. So, you know, here we have a tensile or a tensile member. Here we have a compressive member, compressive, tension, tension. This vertical member, when you solve this, is going to be zero. Uh, sometimes you can write it with just a zero. Sometimes you, what you'll see me do is when I'm solving a truss, I'll just do that. Just put a zero through the member. Actually, I could probably do a little better than that. So here's the member. And sometimes you'll see me just do that. Okay. I'll go ahead, I, I'll go ahead and tell you that member DJ is a zero force member. Okay. Um, that happens in, in truss analysis and that's okay. Um, we'll talk a little bit about zero force members later. I'm sure that there's probably a, a question that comes up in the back of your head is if you have a truss and the member doesn't have any force in it, why would you even put that member there? Like if it's not going to carry any load, what's the point? Well, there's two you know, answers to that. Um, these members can actually serve as bracing elements. Like they're not carrying any load, but they're there to prevent adjacent members from buckling. And so that's one reason to that zero force members are present. Another reason is that is when we look at deflections. So when we do deflection analysis, we're going to have, you know, let's say we're tr looking at this truss and we're trying to determine how much it deflects. Well, we actually end up having to analyze it twice. One with the loads as they're present and another analysis, which we call a virtual analysis. We'll talk about this later, where there's only a single load where we're trying to find deflection. And so maybe under the real loads, there, it isn't a zero force member. This fictitious fake load, this virtual load that we'll talk about later, maybe there are zero force members. So we are going to have to deal with zero force members later on. I'm not going to talk about it now, but I just want to set you up for the fact that you might be doing a trust analysis and you get a member that has zero load in it. And that's fine. That, that happens uh, in, in trusses. So if they are preventing the other member from buckling, are they not carrying loads? They do start carrying loads when the member starts buckling. That becomes a, a big deal. And if we have time, that's something we may discuss in steel design. Because if you have, let's say, a beam and the beam uh, wants, uh, you know, the beam's carrying load and then there's a beam that's just framing into it that doesn't see anything. 
Well, once that member starts buckling, then that brace becomes engaged, and it becomes engaged, you know, something fierce. It can see a lot of force from that buckling phenomenon, but until that happens, it might not be seeing any load at all. So that, that's, a, that's a really great point, um, and that, that's a, we talk about that in great detail in steel design. Um, we're running out of time, and so we're not going to get a chance to finish this. I honestly think that you should finish it uh, on your own. What I'm going to do on the notebook in, uh, in Teams is I'm going to fill in the final answer. So I've got the answer here on the, uh, on the slide, and I'm going to fill this in uh, so that you all have this for practice. So honestly, if I were you, I would refer to that, maybe chug it out on your own. And then you have a homework problem, or you have a homework assignment. You have two problems where I want you to just compute that IT value. It's really simple. I just want to make sure that you do it. And then I have another trust for you where you can exploit symmetry. It's actually a lot easier than the trust that we're doing in class today. So if you can do this, you can certainly do the, uh, the homework assignment. All right. Any other questions? All right. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Randolph, don't forget the dryer sheets. Um, and uh, that's, <laughs> that's all I have, everybody. I, I, you might not live that down. I apologize, but I appreciate the honesty. <laughs> uh, that's all I have, everybody. Y'all have a wonderful weekend. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.